Well, hello, Calvary Online. However, whenever, however you that is that you're watching this service, it's good to be with you. If I haven't gotten a chance to meet you yet, my name is Steve, and I am one of the pastors here on staff. And we're actually in the middle of a series called Rebuilding, where we've been looking at this idea of what does it look like to build our life on the gospel of Jesus. And we've been exploring the book of Ephesians, which is actually one of the most important books that we have in all of scripture because the apostle Paul is going to lay it out for us so clearly in the first three chapters, what is so good about the good news of Jesus. And in the last three chapters, he's going to explore what that good news actually means for our everyday life, in our jobs, in our families, everywhere that we go. And so in the first chapter, he lays out this truth that who we are in Christ is actually the truest thing about us. And when we build our identity on anything other than him, that it's, un- that it's going to crumble under the weight of life. And the last week we opened up to chapter 2 where Pastor Mark began to lay out for us that life without Jesus isn't just bad. It's actually not life at all. It's dead. You see, God isn't just interested in making your life better, but God wants to give us a new life altogether. And so last week, Pastor Mark gave an invitation for anyone who has yet to cross that line of faith to put their trust in Jesus by texting a number. And so I just want to celebrate that we got two texts back last week of people who who have decided that for the very first time that they wanted to build their life on the firmest foundation in all of the universe and all of the cosmos, and that is Jesus himself. And because scripture tells us that there is rejoicing in heaven when one person turns their life over to God, let there be rejoicing in the comment section. And so right now, wherever you are, if you want to drop that praise emoji with like the two praising hands, or you can throw a PTL in there if that's how you like to roll, or if you can't comment right now because you're watching on TV, just give a high five to whoever is sitting next to you. And if you are by yourself, go ahead and just High five yourself, which is also called clapping. So give yourself a clap because this is something to be celebrated. You see, over this past week, I've actually been been thinking about what we experienced last week when two people responded to the gospel. And it struck me that last week when two people responded to the gospel, that we are actually participating in God's mission for humanity. And that when we explore scripture, the entire story of scripture is trying to get us to see that what God wants more than anything else in this world is to be reunited in relationship with us. And so today, as we turn to Ephesians chapter 3, we're going to begin to make that transition from what is the good news of Jesus and what has Jesus done to what does this actually mean for our everyday life. And we're going to explore this idea that when we make God's mission our mission, that we begin to discover the purpose of our lives. Now, we all know the power of purpose. It's the reason why the American author Mark Twain is going to say that the two most important days in a person's life are the day that he is born and the day that they discover the reason why. If we think about what the value of purpose is, I wonder how many of us would want to know more if I said that today you could discover what your purpose is. And that if I could tell you what your purpose is today, that whether you were rich or poor or whether you were paid for it or not, you would be content knowing that your pursuit of this purpose would be worth you giving not only your time to, not only your energy and your effort towards, but even possibly your entire life for. And what if I told you that the pursuit of this purpose would mean that many years from now, when you are laying in your deathbed and you are reflecting back on your life, but you would not regret going after this purpose for one second. Would you want to know more? I believe that this is such an important question that humanity has been on this epic quest to find what our purpose is. And it's reflected in the fact that if you go on Amazon and do a search for books on purpose, that you're going to find about 50,000 books about how to discover your purpose. And there's going to be 50,000 opinions with really long titles about what this, this, the book is about. In fact, one of my favorite titles that I, that I found was the title of this book, Finding Your Purpose. How to find your purpose in life and make the most of your life here on earth. 
a non-religious perspective. And then in brackets, parentheses, what is the purpose of your life? I kind of wonder when I read that, what is the purpose of such a long title? But it struck me as I looked at this title that it was interesting because they had to say, if you are not religious, how do you discover the purpose of your life? And because I can't possibly read 50,000 books on this, I decided to do the next best thing, and that is to go to YouTube. And when I went on YouTube, I found this TED Talk that was entitled, How to Discover Your Purpose in Five Minutes. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, that sounds an awful lot like clickbait, and it was. But I, and apparently I and 15 million other people also fell for this because we began looking at this story, and I, I ended up watching all the way to the end because I found not only his story, but the questions to get to purpose incredibly interesting. And I believe that in the story and in the questions that he brings up, that it actually captures our human quest for purpose. And there's some interesting parallels that we see in Scripture. And so Adam Leipzig, who is this filmmaker, he's a former executive at Disney, found himself at his 20-year reunion at Yale. And what he observed when he was at this party was that 80% of these classmates were incredibly unhappy and unsatisfied and uncontent. And what he's observed was that despite the fact that they had the privilege of going to Yale, despite the fact that they had launched successful careers and that they were, were lucrative in what they were doing and that they were influential, they, they privately expressed to him that they don't know what their life is about and that they are already halfway through it. And then he made the observation of the final 20% of people who had some resemblance of satisfaction and contentment with their life. And he noticed that it had nothing to do with their bank accounts. It had nothing to do with their job titles, but a sense of purpose that gave their life meaning that they could actually answer these five questions. And what they knew when they answered these five questions was the purpose that gave their life meaning. And these are the questions. Who are you? What do you do? Who did you do it for? Which I find incredibly interesting because whether you're religious or not, discovering your purpose has to be bigger than yourself. The next question is, what did those people want or need? Which is about utilizing our gifts and our passion and our talents to actually meet real needs. And the last question that they knew the answer to was how were you changed because of it? Now, these are really solid questions for discovering your purpose, and it's a good place to start. But then I kind of took it to the next level and began thinking, if that is for non-religious people, I wonder how people of faith, people who said, I am going to put my faith in Jesus, how do we begin to discover our purpose? And so I actually want to start today with a story that takes place 2,000 years before a Yale tent party out over in, in wherever it is, right? That, that it actually is a story about a religious terrorist who named Saul who had this life-changing encounter with Jesus. And that when he has this encounter with Jesus, everything about his life would change. Spiritually, vocationally, um, And also physically. And even his very name would change from Saul to Paul. Because the moment that Paul put his faith in Jesus, he began to join the mission of God and he discovered the purpose of his life. In fact, Paul was so committed to this mission that I actually believe that this is the reason why you and I gather from various backgrounds, speaking different language, uh, despite whatever socioeconomic, uh, stat- or whatever our socioeconomic status is, in the midst of a global pandemic, is because of his commitment to the mission of God. And I actually believe today that the same mission that was given to Paul and the same mission that was given to the disciples is actually given to us. And it actually struck me as even just profound studying for this message uh, today that for those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus, those of us who would say that we are Christians should never have to wonder what our purpose in life is. Because God's mission is our purpose. And so today what I want us to do is I want us to explore what God's mission is, how it played out in the life of Paul, and how we can begin to take steps towards it today. 
And so if you guys have your Bibles, you can pull it off your, your shelf and you can dust it off or you can pull it up on your app if you have it. But we're going to be in the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 3. And if you have an analog Bible like myself, you're going to be about three quarters of the way uh, through the Bible. You're probably going to be in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. You're going to continue flipping right past Acts and Romans. Uh, slow down when you get to Galatians. And Ephesians is going to be the next book. If you get to Hebrews or Revelation, you went too far go back left, and if you have any kind of doubt, just use the table of contents. It's incredibly easy. So we are going to be in Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to be starting in verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation. As I have already written briefly, in reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all of the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you therefore not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. Now right away what we see in verse 1 is that Paul says, For this reason... And anytime you come across this in scripture and you see that Paul writes, for this reason, we should ask ourselves, for what reason? And what Paul is referring to is actually what Mark talked about in chapter 2 of Ephesians, that the power of the gospel has the ability to take our life from being dead to bringing it back to life. And that it was actually Jesus' mission to bring back all people back into relationship with God through the cross. That it's on the cross that Jesus would absorb the full destructive capacity of human, human sin in order that we can be at one with God again. In fact, this is what that big Christian word atonement actually means. It means to be at one meant with God. And so Paul turned the mission of Jesus into the message of his life. And what he's saying is that if this is the reason why Jesus came, if this is the reason why Jesus went to the cross, then this has to be the reason why my heart beats in my chest. This has to be the reason why I live. And so Paul is saying it's for this reason that he is a prisoner of Christ. Now you have to know that when Paul was writing this letter, he was actually in prison. So anyone who was reading this letter would have been incredibly confused. What do you mean that you are a prisoner of Christ? Because everyone knows that you are a prisoner of Rome. It might sound just as odd to us today if Paul was writing a letter to us and said, I am in quarantine for Christ. You see, this sentence right here actually tells us that how much actually the gospel had shaped Paul and uh, how, shaped how Paul had viewed his situations. And the best way that we can understand what Paul means by being a prisoner of Christ Jesus is to actually go back to Jesus' teaching about him being the vine in John 15. Because Jesus is going to say, I am the vine and you are the branches. And if you want to bear fruit, then you have to remain or abide or make your home in me. And because Paul takes Jesus seriously, Paul is saying that who I am in Christ and what I do cannot be separated from how I view my life. 
And so even when I have to submit to the authority of Rome, I can trust that God is in control. And because God is in control, it means that if I sit in a prison, it is because he has a purpose for me there. This wouldn't be the first nor the last time that Paul would be in prison. If you go back and you read the book of Acts, it's going to tell us that when Paul is in prison, he takes the opportunity to share the gospel with the guards. Because Paul would rather be shackled in chains and bound to Jesus than to wander free and be far from God's mission. And so what Paul is saying in verse 2 is that if I am quarantined, if I am in prison, it is for your sake. And because Paul has all of this downtime in prison, that he's actually going to craft this letter completely unaware of the fact that one day we were going to grab that letter and we were going to compile it in the Bible and it would become one of the most incredible books that we have. And one of the reasons why this book, this letter to the Ephesians is so important is because in in verses 3 through 6, Paul is going to lay out how a Jewish Messiah becomes the Savior for all of humanity. And so Paul is going to say that this, this plan, this mission is act, was actually a mystery at one point. He's going to say it four times. It means that it, it wasn't known before, but all of a sudden now it is revealed. See, whenever we think about this word mystery, we think of some kind of secret knowledge that's only made available to a few people, or we think of some like Agatha Christie novel. But mystery here simply means something that was not previously known or understood is now made known. So let me illustrate it for you this way. Uh, I wonder how many of you who are watching know my middle name. Uh, Mom, if you're watching, please don't comment. My brother Ray, if you're watching, please don't comment. But, but I'm wondering if, if any of you know my middle name. And if you know it, just go ahead and write it in the comment section now. But to everybody else who doesn't know my middle name, my middle name is Tran. So now that you have that knowledge, please don't use that knowledge for evil. But those of you who didn't know my name before now know my middle name. That mystery has now been solved. And so what Paul is saying is that the mystery of how God had planned to restore humanity to himself from the moment that humans fell is now revealed in Jesus. You see, in Ephesians, the mystery, that mystery of God's mission is the mission of God. And what we see now when we look back on Scripture through the lens of Jesus is that we see that there were clues to what God was doing all throughout Scripture. But it wasn't until Jesus came on the scene that all of a sudden the dots connect. Now, I don't know if, if this, I'm kind of dating myself, but I remember the first time that I watched The Sixth Sense and I get to the very end scene and all of a sudden all the dots in the movie connected and I was like, oh my gosh. Or maybe you don't roll with scary movies, but you've seen the movie Inception. I remember just, you're kind of confused the whole way through and you're wondering what's going to happen. But all of a sudden you get to the final scene, you realize, oh my gosh, this is what connects the entire story. You see, this is what happens with Jesus, that Jesus connects all the dots of the story. Because if we go back, the mission of God didn't begin with Jesus. It didn't begin with Paul, but it started from from all the way back at the beginning, the moment that humanity fell. God's mission was laid out is when God promised to Adam and Eve after they had sinned, that their offspring would crush the head of the driving force behind evil, sin, and destruction in the world that we see in Genesis 3. And then we would see it again when God would choose one family, the family of Abraham, whose offspring would become a blessing to all nations. God would actually reiterate this promise to Moses after he delivers his people from slavery in Egypt. And he takes them out. And in Exodus 19, he said that he would establish them as a nation who would become a kingdom of priests to all the nations. And even when Israel's failure to keep God's laws and keep keep their commands would lead them into exile, that God would reiterate his promise of redemption in Isaiah 52.10, in which he says that all the ends of the earth will know and will see the salvation of God. But all of this doesn't make sense until Jesus comes on the scene. Because what we see in Jesus' life is that all the wrong people from the wrong country, from the wrong religion, with the wrong background are going to be the ones who make the right claim about God. 
And so we meet a woman in John chapter 4 who, who comes from this enemy tribe called Samaria. And she would actually become one of the first to experience the healing restoration of God. And she would be one of the first to make Jesus' mission her purpose. As she goes back to her town, goes back to her village and tells everyone about the Jesus that she had just met. Or the very moment that Jesus breathes his last breath on the cross, that it's from the lips of a pagan Roman centurion who is the embodiment of Israel's enemy and everything that Israel has been pushing against would make the right claim about Jesus and say, surely this man was the son of God. And then at Pentecost, which is what we celebrate on Pentecost Sunday, which is this Sunday, that in Acts 2, 6, what we celebrate today is that the Holy Spirit pour, is poured out onto the disciples and the disciples begin to speak in different languages. And so the reason that they speak in different languages is because then all people could then hear the good news about Jesus in their own language. And what we see is actually the great reversal of the Tower of Babel when people are scattered and we see the beginnings of all of the things that separate us, language and culture and worldview. But now all of it is brought together under the good news of Jesus. And I can go on with a, with a bunch of other verses, but I believe that you get the picture. And that this is actually the reason why Paul in verse 6 is going to say that this mystery is the mission of God, which we see from the very beginning that all the dots connect when we trace it throughout Scripture, that his mission is to be reunited in relationship with all people through Jesus. And he says, now Gentiles, which is a word that just basically means anyone who isn't Jewish, which includes probably you and I, that regardless of our background, our mistakes, or our backstory, can now be shareholders in the promises of heaven in and through Jesus. And then in verses 7 through 8, Paul is going to lay out how he knows this to be true. And it's because of his own experience of the gospel in his own life. And what your grace had done for him. It's interesting when you read through Paul's letter, some of the things that he says about himself is that he calls himself here the least of all of God's people. That he says that he is the least deserving of grace, that he is the worst of all sinners. But yet it's the grace of Jesus that turned Saul the murderer into Paul the missionary. And it's because of this grace that was shown to him and it's because of this grace that transformed Paul that he began to hold on to these convictions. And it's the conviction that the gospel is for everyone, the gospel changes everything, and the gospel is worth giving everything. And so because of the, the grace that was shown to him, how he was transformed, Paul made God's mission his life's purpose and he lived it out. If I wonder as he's penning down these words to the letter to the Ephesians that he's kind of laughing to himself because he's remembering and he's thinking back to this time when he first arrived in Ephesus, which is now modern day Turkey, and we read about it in Acts 19. Because he's probably laughing about the fact that, that he made everyone upset, that he couldn't find anyone who, who wasn't upset at the gospel. The, the Jews didn't like him because he was hanging out with non-Jews who had pagan names like Gaius and Aristarchus and Frank Burgandy, who I know right now is probably commenting right now. You see, for Paul, if, if God's mission is to be reunited and to be in relationship with all people, then that means that Paul himself needs to make himself available to all people. And it's because he held to this conviction that, that the gospel is for everyone. And what we see even in the first century, that the gospel is subtly pushing against the racism that existed in that day. And on the other hand, the Greeks didn't like, uh, didn't like him because the gospel of Jesus was pushing on the idols of success and achievement and innovation and the plurality of ideas. Because Baal believed that the cross of Jesus was actually the only way that God can come to humanity. So he never shied away from that truth. And so in 1 Corinthians, he's going to say it this way, that the message of the cross is an offense. It's foolishness. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. 
And then what Paul's going to do as he closes out chapter 3 is he's going to begin saying in verses 10 through 21 something that is incredibly important that I don't want us to miss today, miss it today. And it's this, is that the mission of God is actually the mission of the church. And so let's look at what Paul says in verse 10. His, God's intent, was that now through the church, circle, underline, highlight that word through the church because it means all of us, not the building, not just the pastors, not just the staff, but all of us who are watching right now, that we are all to make known the manifold, which just means many-sided wisdom of God to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms, according to the eternal purpose that he has accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now we're going to talk about this idea of rulers and authorities in a couple weeks and, and I'm excited to get there. But for now, just let me say this, that the power of the gospel can break the spiritual influencers of sin and destruction that we see in the world. That part of what the church does is not just proclaiming the gospel in words, but also in deeds. That that is the reason why we step into acts of justice. Why we step into a difficult situations because we don't want to just bring the good news of Jesus in words. We also want to bring the good news of Jesus in our very actions. But the point that I want us to grab a hold of today is that the gospel isn't just about our personal salvation. It's about joining in on the mission of God to see all people restored and reunited into relationship with God in and through Jesus. This is our purpose in Christ. So if this is true, let me call out just a couple things that this actually means for us to make God's mission our purpose. The first thing that we can call out is that when we place our faith in Christ, we don't go into ministry. It's not for the few, but we are in ministry immediately. I just think back to uh, when I was a kid, I was watching the Mission Impossible movies and Ethan Hunt, if you, if you know the movies, always gets this mission at the very beginning and, and it has this little recording that says, your mission, should you choose to accept it before it self-destructs? But the gospel community actually would say it this way, that when we choose Jesus, we accept our mission. It's a part of what happens when we place our faith in Jesus that it actually isn't an option. The second thing that we can call out then is that we don't go on a mission. The mission is all around us. One of the things that we get caught in is that when we think about mission, we think about going to someplace else, somewhere else, or that it's actually the job of the chosen few. But the reality is that the mission is all around us. I was talking with my brother today and uh, my brother had served in the army as a sergeant. He worked in military intelligence and he had this, uh, this relationship with um, uh, Colonel, Colonel Christopher Himsel, who had just a profound effect on, on my brother and, and how he thought about life. But he said that Colonel Christopher Himsel would always say something that sticks with my brother that he uses to this day. And Colonel Christopher Himsel said this, mission first, people Always. This was his saying. And what it implies is that people stand in the center of all missions. And without people, there is no mission. And when my brother said that, I could not think of a better way to describe God's mission as a heart for his people. Now, I, I'm going to invite you into just my prayer life for a little bit because um, it makes it feel a little bit vulnerable. But for a a while now, at least a couple of years, uh, I have been praying for a revival. I don't know why, but, but I, was, I was talking with Danny just a couple of years back and, and I was saying that I can't shake this feeling that I'm going to see a, a revival in our lifetime. And so I began praying towards that. And so I even keep a bag of coffee from, uh, from Ritual Coffee Roasters. One of their beans is called the Revival Roast. And I keep it in my office just as a reminder of, of what I believe that, that God wants to do here. And the truth is that, that as I was thinking about this idea, I almost hesitated saying it to you because it's a little bit intense. But uh, just the other night, I was kind of out on a run at midnight when all of a sudden it sh I was struck with this thought. And I believe that, that God was saying something to me and maybe saying something to you right now. But I felt like God was saying, until the church 
awakens to the reality and awakens to the truth and starts to believe that it is on mission, we will never see revival. See, I believe that one of the things and one of the reasons why we begin to lose sight of our mission is, what, is when we forget that the gospel is for everyone, that the gospel changes everything, and that the gospel is worth giving everything, all of us, to. And so Paul is going to say in, in, in Ephesians 3.20 that God can do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in us. I love this word immeasurably more because I'm, I'm struck with this idea that when the church, when you and I start to believe that we are on mission, that we are going to begin to see revivals happen, not just, not just wide in our city, but in our neighborhoods, with our neighbors close to us. And that is what is going to expand outward throughout Silicon Valley. See, I believe that revival is possible when the church believes it is on mission. And that is what I want to give my life to. And while I know that that sounds a little bit intense for you and you might be wondering, whoa, I didn't sign up for this whole like revival thing and I didn't, like, I didn't sign up for this mission. I, I think that there's actually a few easy steps that we can take today, this week, in order to move towards that mission. And the first thing that we can do is that we can unite our vocation with his purpose. The reality is that it really doesn't matter what your day job is. We can still join in on God's mission. Uh, Even if I had not become a pastor and I went directly into my family business selling jewelry, I would still be on mission. Paul's day job, in fact, was actually to be a tent maker. That's what paid the bills. But he knew that his purpose and his calling was to be a part of God's mission. And so it was actually even illustrated to me the power of this this week, uh, maybe just a couple days ago, when it went viral of this incredible story of an Amazon uh, delivery woman who was delivering goods to this boy who was at high risk to COVID. And the Ring Doorbell video system had caught the woman dropping uh, off this package and then saying a quick prayer for the family and it ended up going viral right behind me. And she stands there for a second. She says a prayer. She crosses herself and then she gets out of there, but they caught it. And so this woman's name was Monica Salinas. The reality is that every day she goes to work and she delivers packages. And that might be her vocation, but that is not her calling or her purpose. So I don't know what you do. Maybe you're a programmer. Maybe you're a manager. Maybe you do work for Amazon. That might be your vocation, but your ultimate calling and purpose is the mission of God. The second thing that we can do is that we can surrender our brokenness to God's purpose. Quite simply, God uses everything. And we tend to to slip into the trap that God only uses people who are talented, who speak well, who do this well, who have their life put together. But the reality is that Paul's life is actually a testament to the fact that God can use broken people who are deeply in need of him, that he is, that God is able to empower us through his Holy Spirit to accomplish his tasks. I love that that is exactly what we saw in in Chris Evans' testimony last week. And the number of people who just have reached out to me and said, hey, can I connect with Chris? Because what he went through, I'm going through. And just in one five-minute interview, God made an incredible impact. Now, Chris could have easily said no thank you to the interview. He could just be silent about his testimony. But the truth is that he surrendered it to God and allowed God to use it for his purpose. The third thing that we can do is that we can connect our gifts with God's purpose. I love that God wants to use the things that you have already naturally been gifted with. Paul, we see that Paul was actually a Pharisee. And so God used his passion and his zeal. We know that Paul was also a philosopher who was able to write in Greek. He thought in Greek. He was able to dialogue with the philosophies of the day, with the Stoics, with the Epicureans. And that he took the time to be a student of the cultures that he was going to. And he found avenues for the gospel to take place. 
And in a lot of ways, as we, as we uh, remember the late, great Ravi Zacharias, who was just this brilliant man that in some ways, Paul uh, was kind of the prototype for what Ravi did, which he, he uses his intellect in order to bring God's glory to places uh, that, that are skeptical. And the fourth thing that we can do is that we can actually invest in people and we can introduce them to Jesus. The truth is that Paul befriended pagans like Gaius and Aristarchus and, and Frank and who couldn't be more different than who Paul was because he believed that the gospel was for everyone. And, and for me, I was struck this week, even as, as the president went out and, and he announced that churches and declared that churches were essential, that I actually took a moment to take inventory of my own life, to make it personal and begin asking myself this question. Um, do my neighbors think that I am essential? Do I contribute to the life and love and the community in and through Jesus right in my neighborhood? Or do I just go home and shut the garage and just move on with my life? And as I began thinking about this, I began becoming personally convicted because I had to ask myself this question, am I more concerned with making a statement than I am about being a testimony to the love of Jesus? To live for the mission of God is to love the people in your sphere of influence. And it is our job not to convert people, but to simply introduce them to Jesus and love people. There was a dad that I met a few years uh, back at Kitty Campus where our, our kids went to school. And uh, I, when this whole thing started, he kind of reached out to, sh to share a little bit about uh, his, his struggles with his relationship with God. And we ended up going on this cool walk together and we were just having this great conversation. And one of the things that I encouraged him with was, hey, just keep saying yes to God. And he stopped me right there in this moment. And he said, I am not saying yes to God. I'm saying yes to you. And it struck me that people will say yes to you before they say yes to Jesus. And so what our call is, what our purpose is in our spheres of influence is to simply love people and introduce them to Jesus. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this incredible truth that the moment we step into relationship with you, we receive a purpose for our lives. God, I know that maybe there are some people who are out there who because of their loss of a job or because of what's going on because of the COVID thing that we are feeling a little bit like we don't know who we are anymore without going to work, without going to that place uh, where we find so much value and identity. And now we're wondering what our purpose is. God, for, for those who are watching right now who have yet to cross that line of faith, God, I invite them to do that right now. And maybe in the comments or maybe if they want to text the number to just let us know that right now, if we cross that line of faith, we have the promise and the assurance that we see right here in Scripture. That the moment we put our faith in you, that we discover your mission. And when we make your mission our mission, we discover the purpose of our lives. And now, God, I want to pray for each and every single one of us who calls Calvary home. And maybe we haven't thought about this idea in a really long time, maybe in the midst of the fact that we actually have faith in you, but yet we are wrestling with our purpose. I pray that you would bring us back to what we know to be true. And that is your mission is to be reunited in relationship with all people and that we get to play a role in that. And so God, even here and now, I pray God that you would remind us of the truth that the gospel is for everyone, that the gospel changes everything, and the gospel is worth giving everything to. God, empower us with your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I want to close with something real quick. I, um, I have on my board a, a little post-it note and the post-it note just says, the mission will always cost us something. And it's just this reminder to, to me that I am always to keep the kingdom of God first, that, that what I want for my life is what God wants for my life. 
And that sometimes that comes at a cost to me. But what I want us to do when, when I think about this idea of mission is I want us at some time this week to find a post-it note, um, go get one from, from the store. And what I want you to do is I want you just to write on this post-it note, God's mission is my purpose. And I want you to put it somewhere where you, where you see every single day to be reminded that who you are in Christ means that you get to participate in the incredible mission of God. And that is to restore all people back into relationship with him. And so now will you receive this benediction and this, this uh, blessing? And now may God, who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, fill you and empower you with the Holy Spirit that you might know down to your bones that you participate in God's mission. And may you look at your spheres of influence, who you hang out with every single day, where you live, work, and play with a new sense of purpose, knowing that God wants to use you right there. And may it begin a revival in that neighborhood, in that town, and eventually pour out through the city. We pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus, who is able to do this. Amen and amen.